I'd like to start uh, this afternoon's session by acknowledging the traditional custodians of this land, the Ngunnawal people, and also extend my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. So welcome everyone and welcome to those online that are joining us via webcast and uh, the first of what we hope to be many DTA chat type uh, events that uh, we're going to be holding over the course of the year. Uh, for those of you that I haven't met, I'm Gavin Slater and I'm the Chief Executive of the Digital Transformation Agency. Um, well, we have a wonderful guest here this morning, uh, Professor Genevieve Bell. Um, you know, I think she's well m known to, I guess, most people. I think everyone in the room here today would have at least uh, checked out her profile, followed her, her Boy Electra series, uh, checked out uh, uh, her on social media. But uh, really, these are my words, but I reckon the rock star of, um, I think, a thought leader in, in thinking about sort of innovation, um, technology, disruption, and, uh, and everything else that, that goes with it. So personally, I'm, I'm really wrapped to, to have Genevieve here. I saw her speak early on in my tenure in the APS um, probably about six months ago and uh, really felt totally switched on by, by what Genevieve had to say and to share. So it's great that we all have an opportunity to learn and, uh, and broaden our horizons and our perspectives. Um, as I said, she's a renowned uh, anthropologist uh, with many interesting experiences and insights, and I pulled a couple out. I mean, she's worked in the Silicon Valley, worked at Intel for you know, a couple of decades, uh, but a couple of interesting things that I thought you might uh, find interesting as well. And, and um, one is you were quoted, um, you were brought in to bring the stories of everyone outside the building, inside the building, and make them count. And uh, I think that sort of really resonates and you have to understand people to build the gener next generation of technology. And I know you've been chatting about human-centred design as opposed to just user-centred design. They say you hold 13 patents. I checked you out on LinkedIn again this morning. I could only count four. So I don't know if there's a disconnect between the four and the 13, but perhaps for another day. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, you've been inducted into the, uh, the Woman in Technology International Hall of, Hall of Fame. You were named one of the 25 women in technology to watch and what was on the 100 most creative people uh, in business list. 2013, uh, Genevieve was named as the winner of the Anita Borg Institute Woman in, of Vision in Leadership Award. 2014 included in Elle magazine's first list of influential women in technology. So as I said, uh, an amazing individual. Um, one of the other things that I thought was really interesting, and I think it was in the New York Times, and you've just mentioned it now to, uh, to Janine, uh, you were quoted in one interview saying, it's a one-way ticket. Oh, you learned Aboriginal survival skills, such as how to squeeze a drink out of an Australian water-holding frog. And you were quoted in one interview saying, it's a one-way ticket for the frog to none frogness. So uh, said another way, I think once you squeeze water out of a frog, the frog's not going to hop around anymore. It's probably the way I would uh, interpret that. Uh, anyway, um, Genevieve, it's great having you here today. I'm going to hand over to you and uh, really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. And then we'll have an opportunity for about 20 minutes of uh, questions, both from the audience and those uh, that are streaming in live as well. So let's give Genevieve a great warm welcome. Thank you. All right, that's a daunting and intimidating introduction. Um, I have to give the usual set of caveats in advance. I'm jet lagged, I have a cold, I've just taken Sudafed and Strepsil. Um, so if you thought I was speedy usually, I'm now on all of my drugs of choice and preference. Oh, plus three coffees, because I'm back in Australia. <laughs> Which means there is no slower speed than this and it's only gonna get worse. Um, but listen, I'm incredibly excited to be here. I'm always very happy to be back in Australia and to be welcomed back onto country. I want to acknowledge that I am back on country. And to remind all of you in the room that sometimes that feels like a ritual, but there is nothing like that anywhere else in the rest of the world, and it is remarkable that it gets to be part of our heritage and who we are. So I want to say I'm happy to be home on Nungamore country, and I'm happy to be here to get to talk to all of you. The Digital Transformation Agency has been on my radar for a long time, back when you had a different acronym. Um, so I'm excited to get to see you again, and I'm happy to be part of this whole conversation. I'm a little frightened by that introduction, Gavin. I did realize a long time ago that if I told Americans I knew how to get water out of frogs, nothing good would come of it. Um, and that continues to be true. I also realized that you might have walked off with the clicker to move the slides forward. Um, nope. No? No. Oh, well. Have we got a clicker somewhere? Oh, here we go. There we go. See? Is that a clicker? That looks like one. Here Excellent. Oh, look at that digital transformation. <laughs> right here in front of you. So. 
I don't know what to do with that introduction. I do know how to get water out of frogs. It's only one particular kind of frog and it will kill them. Um, that is true. And I'm sure I said that in America at some point to point out to them that I wasn't like everyone else in the room. Um, I realize now there's plenty of other ways I could introduce myself and I might do that now. I thought what we'd do for the next 30 minutes, however, was talk a little bit about where I think the future is going. And I wanna locate this as a couple of things, right? This is not a set of predictions, this is a conversation. These are not the only answers, these are some of the things that are top of my mind. And I really wanna be clear, this is coming at it from an intersection of someone who spent time both in the valley thinking about technology, but as an anthropologist who spends all of her time thinking about human beings. And uh, so there are lots of ways to introduce myself, and indeed it's been 25 years in Silicon Valley, but long before that, there's a couple of other things that I always need to say about myself. I'm the child of an anthropologist. That means I grew up on my mother's field sites in central and northern Australia and briefly in Indonesia in the 1970s and 1980s. I spent my time with Aboriginal people at a time when those settlements were still new. Some of them were less than 20 years old, when people still remembered their first sight of cattle and Europeans and fences, and when it was a very complicated time to be in the Northern Territory. So my childhood is the Land Rights Act, and that's a different moment than the one we find ourselves in now. It also means that I spent my childhood in Aboriginal communities where I went to bilingual schools, I spoke Walpri, I ditched class a lot to go hunting and gathering with people, I got to kill anything around me that moved and then eat it. Uh, I didn't have to wear shoes and it was arguably the best childhood you can possibly imagine. It was also not one without its complications. When we came back from Central Australia the first time, I remember fighting with my teachers in class here. I am a Canberra girl after all, Turner Primary, Lynham High School, Dixon College, and wait for it, wait for it, the Department of Local Government and Administrative Services. Um, but in those early days coming back, I remember saying to my mother that I couldn't work out how to square the conversations that were happening around me in Canberra about Aboriginal people with the Aboriginal people I'd spent my childhood with. And one of the things she impressed upon both my brother and I was that the world as it was wasn't the world that we had to have. And that as a result, you had a moral obligation to make things different. That if you had any commitment in your world, it ought to be to making things better and making things different. And that meant you should put your time, your energy, your intellectual efforts, everything on the line. And she lived her life that way and she made it quite clear to my brother and I that we would have to do that too. And so I've pursued an odd career path as a result of that. I left Australia in my early 20s to go to university in the US. I found myself after one thing led to another at Stanford. My PhD is in Native American studies, feminist and queer theory. You can see how I would end up at Intel almost immediately with that kind of background. Um, because obviously that's the kind of people they were hiring in the late 1990s. That is of course not true. Um, I was on the faculty at Stanford after I finished my PhD. I was a professor of anthropology. I was perfectly happy doing that. I was in a tenure track job. Frankly, I was in one of the better places you could be in your life at that moment in time. And yet I met a man in a bar in Palo Alto about this time 20 years ago actually. And he changed my life. In America that always means I need to add I didn't marry him because they're convinced that could be the only way he would change my life. But the reality is he asked me one really simple question. He said, what do you do? And I told him I was an anthropologist. And he said, what's that? I said, I studied people for a living. He said, why? At this point, I probably should have worked out he was an engineer. Um, <laughs> I said, because they seemed interesting. And he said, but what do you do with that? And I said, I'm sure not without, you know, the right degree of hubris, I'm a professor. And he looked at me and said, couldn't you do more? And I thought, yes, I could stop talking to you because you're kind of irritating. <laughs> and so I wandered off and stopped speaking to him. So it was a surprise when he called me the next day at my house because we're talking 20 years ago. And I hadn't given him my phone number because my mother was also very clear about the other piece of advice, which is that you don't give your number to strange men in bars. <laughs> And he counted, and I hadn't given him my number. And we're talking before Facebook, LinkedIn, and there are 13 patents, there's just four of them on LinkedIn. Before LinkedIn, before Facebook, before Twitter, before Tinder, before any way you could have found me. You couldn't type redheaded anthropologist into the internet and get my name, though if you do type redheaded anthropologist into the internet now, I am the first search term that turns up. <laughs> I have done something with my life, that is it. But at the time, he did it the old-fashioned way. He called every anthropology department in the Bay Area looking for a red-headed Australian. And the anthropology department at Stanford said, do you mean Genevieve and would you like her home phone number? <laughs> yeah, these are the days before data privacy. Um, and he called me, he offered me a job, I turned him down, he offered me lunch, I accepted that. 
Turns out being a graduate student, you never get over the prospect of free food. Um, and I was willing to do almost anything for lunch. I met him, ultimately I met the people at Intel. Through a very complicated dance, I ended up at Intel. On my second day of my new job, my boss sat me down and said, we're very excited that you've come to Intel at this point. I was their first anthropologist. Um, and my new boss said, and here's your job description. She said, there are two really important things. I'm like, excellent. I like the clarity of this. So I opened my notebook and I wrote down to number one and two. I said, okay, what, what am I doing, Chris? And she said, well, the first thing is women. I'm like, um, which women, Chris? She said, no, all women. I'm like, what do you want me to do with all women? She's like, oh, if you could tell us what they want, that'd be great. <laughs> so I write down women all and underline that a few times and try to work out what is the research project you will do that will have some necessary characteristics, one of explaining that women all isn't actually a meaningful category and the other one actually telling a semiconductor manufacturer what women want because that seemed like possibly a bad place to go. But I realized you could spend the rest of your life doing that, so it was troubling to me to imagine that this boss thought I should do a second thing as well. Because the first thing is explain women. It's a little frightening to imagine what job number two might be. And so I said, oh God, what's job two? And she said, oh, that's really easy. Here at Intel, we have an ROW problem. I'm thinking, yep, yeah, I have one too. Hi, um, I don't know what ROW stands for. And my new boss says, ah, that's rest of world. I'm like, okay, um, so for the sake of clarity, where is world such that you have something you describe as rest of world? And my new says, oh, that's really simple. We have America and the rest of the world. <laughs> and we're so excited that you're here because you come from there. <laughs> I'm like, okay, good then. So I looked at my job description and I went, women and the rest of the world. I think I'll be busy. And so I went back to my desk and I had an 18 and a half year career where my job was really to make sense of women and the rest of the world. And over time I added American men to that because that seemed like an act of kindness and kind of rounded out the set. Um, and my job was really to put people back into the conversations about making new technology. Maybe not even back, maybe just put them into the conversations about making technology. How do we think about innovation where the innovation isn't just about what's technically possible but about what people want? about how do you work out what are people's pain points and their aspirations and how do you build things that map to those rather than just solving technical problems, how do you solve the right technical problems? And my job and the job of all the teams I built at Intel was to stubbornly and persistently and doggedly insist that the things we did needed to touch human beings. That the measure of success wasn't just the units that we sold but the things that we made possible and that the conversation should be as much about what do human beings want to get done and how do we make that possible as it was about megahertz and microprocessors and nanometers and all of those things. And you know, I'd give myself a B, sometimes a B plus on that effort. It's fairly hard to change a large company like that. But in doing so, I learned a tremendous number of things about how you drive the right conversations and perhaps more importantly, and I think more relevantly to the DTA, how you ask the right questions. Because it turns out that's what it really comes down to. It's not about the answers, it's about can you ask the right questions that unpack what the genuine challenges are and that open up that space. And so in the spirit of that kind of notion of not the answers but the questions, I want to kind of walk you through what I think the big questions are that we're facing as we move forward into the world today. And I want to start with this quote by William Gibson. It gets out a lot and it is an excellent quote. William Gibson is a science fiction writer and he was interviewed in The Economist back in 2003 and he was asked about the future. What will happen in the future, Mr Gibson, he was asked. And his, and his answer was pretty straightforward. The future is not somewhere else. Like, it's not a thing over the horizon waiting for us to arrive in it. What he said was, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. By which he meant, the future's already around us, it's just not always where you were standing at that moment in time. I, think, I always think that's an interesting provocation. And as I've thought about this quote over the years, I started to think about, well, back in 2003, what would we have been looking at? And this photo is from 2003. This photo was taken by a remarkable colleague of mine at RMIT, a woman named Larissa Horath. And this is a photo she took on a train platform in Tokyo. Now, the thing about that photo is you don't have to look at it too hard to think that could be right now. That doesn't look like 2003, that looks like 2018. Clothes are a little daggier, but we still recognize it, right? Phones, the body language, pretty much everything about that looks like now. It doesn't look like 15 years ago. It looks like the present. 
But I can tell you when Larissa took that photo and we, we took photos like it and we brought them back to big American tech companies, what they said is, that's just Tokyo. That's just Docomo, the Japanese telco company. That's just the local stuff. That's only happening in Tokyo because of the telco. And what they said by that, what they meant here is that if you were actually to ask people what they were doing here on this platform in 2003, location-based services, they were chatting with people near them, they were swapping photos, they were swapping early, basically, emoji, they were dating using location-based services, they were doing a whole lot of things that we would recognise today. But in 2003, it was dismissed out of hand as simply being a Japanese phenomena made possible by a local telco and by basically what was seen as idiosyncrasies. Now, of course, the reality is we look at this now and it doesn't look that strange at all. In fact, it looks, other than the fact that it's more public transportation and less cars, it looks remarkably familiar. So the question then becomes, what is around us right now that we are writing off that 10, 15 years from now we're going to look at it and go, oh, shit, the future was right there and we didn't bother looking at it properly? And yes, I did just swear. I'm sorry about that. I'm blaming the Sudafed for that one. So... Seven things I think that you could look at right now that would in fact let us know what the future was going to look like if we were willing to ask some hard questions. And none of these will come as a surprise to you, frankly. I think they're part of our conversations, but we're not very good at interrogating them as critically as perhaps we should. And the first one is to talk about data and all of its, you know, well, discontents, all of its contents, right? We spent an enormous amount of time over the last five years talking about big data, about a data-driven economy, about waves of data. Of course, what we haven't done in those conversations is parsed what's new and what isn't. I mean, frankly, anyone who's been in government for more than 10 minutes knows that data is what government is built on, and governments have been built on data for a very long time. The doomsday book forms the basis of the British government's theories about regulating the environment and regulating taxation basis, and that was built in, you know, 1084 AD. So data's been around for a really long time. The current pieces of data I think we should be paying attention to actually come more from the commercial world than the private world. And there are two instances I'm thinking of here in particular that are relevant for thinking about notions of data, its ownership, and its consequences. So at the moment, one of the ways as a human being we might encounter our own data is data that's generated by our bodies. So those of you who have a Fitbit, an Apple Watch, who've had some kind of tracker on you to track your activities, know that that's not an uncomplicated space. About two years ago in the United States, a court case commenced where a Fitbit, so a fitness tracking device, was being used to um, effectively assert that the person who wore it was committing perjury on the stand. The person on the stand says they were at home at bed asleep, not committing the crime at hand. The Fitbit says they were somewhere else engaged in vigorous activity co-present with where the crime was committed. It turns out in the United States at law, the person who was wearing that Fitbit has no rights in the data their body generated and that Fitbit data is owned by the company. And so when the company was subpoenaed, they turned over the data to the court. The data was then used against the individual. That's an interesting notion about what our bodies generate and where that data might go and who begins to own it. It's not the first one. I'm sure most of you saw the news over the last two weeks about Strava, so a fitness tracking object and an enterprising young researcher here at the Australian National University who managed to use the fitness tracking data and people's leaderboards to determine where secret American bases were based on where people were running in places where no running should be happening. <laughs> now, of course, what that starts to mean is thinking about data, our bodies, how that data is used and by whom is a complicated morass. And starting to think about where the challenges come with that is complicated too. There's another instance again in the United States of a managed healthcare service providing company who have about 20 million subscribers, if you want to think about them that way. Uh, so they have all of their healthcare data. They purchased all the credit card data related to those same 20 million people and merged the data sets. Again, not illegal and not, at this point, technically impossible. So now, your credit card data is co-present with your healthcare data. So now your healthcare company knows how many times you go to Macca's or whether you purchased furniture from Ikea, because it turns out fur furnish purchasing furniture from Ikea is a sure sign of emergency room admissions. Um, <laughs> flat pack furniture is, in fact, every bit as dangerous as we always imagined. <laughs> but it also means that there is no way of thinking through the social compact about data collected under one set of circumstances being married with data collected under another. Now, it is perfectly possible from a technical sense to stop that happening. You can watermark data, you can meta-tag data, 
Gavin's healthcare data and Gavin's credit card data could be held separately, and at the point that his healthcare data finds itself near his credit card data, notification could happen. Hey, Gav, I'm hanging out with your medical data. How do you feel about that? You know, we could have an opt-in, opt-out mechanism. There are plenty of ways of doing that technically, but no one's been asked to make it happen yet. Now imagine about how long does data live for? We have rules at law about certain kinds of data. How long does taxation data survive? How long does medical data survive? Digital data is in some ways mostly survived by the transparency of the platform and how long you can access it, but those aren't good rules to move forward on. So how do we think about what data exists, what data it's co-present with, what perceptions get built on the basis of that, and what the consequences of that are, are not just issues that are going to get weighed out in the commercial realm, but have enormous implications for government. How do we think about certain bodies of data sitting with other bodies of data and the interpretations that get based on top of that and the judgments that are rendered therein? On the one hand, it's easy to argue that efficiency should win there. It would be efficient if that could happen. The reality is there are certain kinds of judgments that will get made that cannot be undone, that may not be about efficiencies. They may be about notions of fairness, about judgments, about equity that all get pretty complicated. Second thing to think about there is how is the data collected, under what circumstances and under what conditions? So it was remarkable last year to listen to a conversation about what had happened to data that Norman Tyndale collected, American anthropologist who collected uh, genealogical and genetic data from Australian Aboriginal people back in the 1930s and 1940s, was done under what you wouldn't want to call an informed consent protocol. And before people here were willing to analyse that data and make determinations on it, they actually went back and got consent from all the families and descendants and living people from whom that data was collected. It took a really long time. It was an incredible investment in doing that, but it also said that just because the data has been collected doesn't mean it should be used. That's a complicated thing. Now imagine that we are going to have a world where algorithms get built on top of that data. So if algorithms are simply automating a task using a data set, and we want to buy those algorithms, do we want to know what data they were trained on? Do we want to have some visibility into whose data was used there? Do we want to think about whether that data was collected by standards we would approve of here in Australia or any, anywhere else? Do we want to think about what those data sets bring with them that's lurking inside them? Do we want to think about how all of those things function? And then last but by no means least in the world of data, one of the challenges here is of course that data only represents the world as it has been, not the world as it will be. The thing about data is that it is always retrospective. It's always the past. And the thing about the world most of us are committed to building is it often doesn't look like the past. If you were going to build a pay equity tool, for instance, inside the APS, you probably wouldn't use existing APS salary data to do it. Because if you were to build a pay equity tool based on the salary data that exists, you would build into it salary and equities because that's the, what the past data looks like. So how then do you think about where an intervention comes? How do you get to agreement about that? What do those things look like? Uh, I have a colleague of mine who says that more data equals more truth, and I always think that more data just equals more data. And being careful about how you want to use it requires asking a whole series of questions about it, but those questions are already around us. These are not ones we need to wait five years. We could just mine the world around us and go, there's already a whole lot of questions we might want to ask. Which leads neatly into the next point about whether AI or algorithmic living has already arrived. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about AI and algorithms. They're not exactly co-present terms, but they have a relationship between one another. As I said, an algorithm is merely an automated set of tasks, usually back-ended by data. So if this happens, then you do this. If this, then that. And they're relatively straightforward things that way. And we've been in a world of algorithms for a very long time, certainly ones that operate in a computational world, recommendation engines, everything from Google to Amazon to Netflix to Tinder are all versions of this. They don't do a lot. They merely say, if these things are happening, these things are likely. Now, of course, what's built into all of those is judgments and notions about how things connect to other things and people's determinations about what sets of data connect to other sets of data. We have a great deal of evidence coming out of both the United States and a few other places at the moment about the challenges with algorithms and about how much human activity is built into them and how much you need to think about data sets when you think about these things. Uh, Google has been wonderful about making clear their experiments with machine learning and some of the challenges therein. Um, those are instructive for what they start to say. So last year and the year before, Google 
put together a series of algorithms to do shortcut activity, one of them around labeling photos. So I'm sure most of you know this experiment. Google created an algorithm. The algorithm was to label photos. It turns out in order to make algorithms, one of the ways you do this is you hive off a certain percentage of a data set, about 10%. You build the algorithm based on the activities inside that data set. You then test it against the rest. Test and control, good mechanism. So they tested it on 10%, put it out to the 100%, it produced the same thing, they released it to all of us, and it turned out this particular algorithm labeled black faces as gorillas. It's not good. Google immediately went, ah, not good, pulled the thing off, fixed it, put it back out. Had to do an analysis of why they had gotten to that place, and that was a really interesting moment, because it turned out the data set they were using, the 10% to the 100%, was a fair and reasonable sample. The 100% was not a reasonable sampling of the world. It was a sampling of the images they had within their organization. It was also the case that when they had run an eyeball test on it, no one caught that because the design team wasn't sensitive to that set of issues. So now you have two challenges, right? How do you think about your data? What is your data representative of? If it's not representative of the world, how do you get it there? And if it isn't representative of the world and you can't get it there, how do you determine that the faces that are, or the people that are looking at it have enough capacity to go, uh-oh, this is probably not representative of the world? That's a whole set of steps that aren't usually inside the way we talk about machine learning or deep learning, or frankly, what it means to think about a set of algorithms. But as soon as we have these entrenched and making decisions, those decisions embody both human biases, data biases, and then they compound, because then they scale out over time. We have plenty of examples of this not working. We have examples of it working too, then we have some that sit somewhere in between. How we think about reviewing these objects, how we think about unboxing them and unpacking them are really complicated pieces. So the court case I would point to in the United States, again here that I think is instructive, has to do with a sentencing guideline tool that's been developed in the United States by a commercial company that is used to facilitate judges rendering sentences more effectively. So it's a sentencing guideline tool that takes the guidelines, you plug in a series of attributes about the defendant, it gives you the parameters by which you should sentence them. It turned out this particular tool was more likely to sentence African American defendants to harsher sentences than white defendants. Um, now, you might argue, is that because African Americans reoffend more often? The data actually doesn't bear that out. It turns out this tool has lurking inside of it somewhere a determination. The challenge there, it turns out, however, is that determination is commercial incompetence because it was produced by a company who are not willing to black unbox, unbox the determining weighting features inside of it. Now, imagine every time as a government we purchase a piece of software, we purchase a service, we purchase a good, how is it that we know what's inside of it? We have a capacity to already do that with other things. Think about Australia's rules about biosecurity in particular, or those of you who are old enough, think about Australia's rules about literature and censorship. We have had very clear notions about what was going to be appropriate inside this country and what wasn't. This is the next place we need to think about how you scrutinise these objects. But asking these objects to unbox themselves is very tricky. Asking the people who build them to unbox them is trickier still, and working out what your parameters are for how you feel about that is actually really interesting. But we already see the cases unfolding here, right? We've already seen the court cases about bias. We've seen them about uh, unintentional and intentional harm. We've seen ones that were simply just quirky and odd. So one of the very first website dating companies in the United States had sitting inside of its matching algorithms that would only match men with women who were three to five inches shorter than them. Apparently blokes only like short girls. That's really what you should take from that. And they built it into the algorithm and no one noticed for a while until someone went, why are all the women you keep like this way, not this way? And that took a while to sort out. Now it turned out the person who built it just figured that's how desire went. Now imagine all the places that is true, right? Imagine all the places that we will normalize things that are someone, one person's idea, whether it is about notions about relationships, whether it's notions about appropriate behavior, about parenting, about savings rates. Think about all the stuff that gets built into that and all the ways in which that is intensely complicated. And imagine those complications are already all around us, but we are moving into a world where there will be more of them. One of the other things we hear a lot in the fieldwork we were doing at Intel, and I've continued to hear now, is this tension between the notion of technology that's always on and always sensing, and the notion that people want time without technology. 
So think about, I'm willing to bet in many of your lives now, you have a moment every weekend where you think, I just don't want to answer any of those things anymore. <laughs> I don't want to look at my inbox. I don't want anyone to call me on the telephone. I don't want to be text. I don't want to look at Facebook. You have a moment of going, I've had quite enough of all of that. I'm willing to bet in some of your households there are complicated conversations that still go on about whether laptops come on vacation, about whether you can look at your phone for work, about whether the phone is allowed in the bedroom. Those are not uncommon conversations. They get more complicated when we start to think about all the other objects that come into your world that you don't get to switch on and off that are always on and always sensing. So whether that is things like Amazon Echo, Google's Hello, there are a whole series of products that are always on and always sensing because they're always listening that create some really interesting challenges in people's homes and really interesting challenges, again, about what it looks like to have a world where you cannot get away from technological activity. We know that there are certainly cultural moments where people want to create spaces where this isn't happening. It's hard to think about how you do that when you're not always the one who can opt in. So what does it mean when you come to my house where there's an Alexa sitting on my kitchen countertop and she's listening to you too, not just me? What does it mean when you're in any number of world cities where you are being surveilled and where your opt-inness is simply that you've turned up in that city? So how we think about some of our notions here about presence, about permissions, about opting in and opting out are really tricky. And we were used to it when it was our activity. You pick something up, you logged into something. Now it's simply your appearance, your body, your face, your voice, your movement, all become part and parcel of a world of things that are being collected. And how you think about that is actually both culturally complicated, personally complicated, has to do with all sorts of features, but how you unpack that turns out to be really tricky. And we already started to see people moving to different kind of mechanisms about this, either turning everything off. Uh, I can tell you some of it is certainly gendered. Uh, Bartsha Friedman at the University of Washington has done a lot of work on looking at how women perceive surveillance technologies and pseudo-surveillance technologies, and the gendering of putting uh, <laughs> anything over the camera in your laptop shell and anything over other pieces of technology in your life, those things turn out to be quite complicated because the consequences of being surveilled turn out also to be quite complicated. And then even if you don't think of it as surveillance, how do you feel about having something always on and always listening in your home? Because it turns out there are objects that are now doing that. And then think about when those objects are not even visible on your countertop but are in fact your electrical meter, which is now engaging in constant censoring and sharing that information and where we have enough technology already to feel down the wire if you have a smart grid and a smart electrical box to actually shut down individual pieces of technology in your home. So now, rather than load shedding your suburb, we'll just load shed all of your air conditioners or all of your televisions. That gets complicated in this world, right, but is increasingly possible. I was telling Gavin right before I got here that this sign here turns up on most trash cans outside of American chemists. So on the garbage bin is a sign that tells you not to discard your personal information there. That's an interesting warning sign on a garbage can at multiple levels. We also know that we're coming out of a period where there is an enormous amount of anxiety about notions of surveillance, about how we think about who is listening and under what circumstances. I've just said there were a bunch of commercial products that live in your home that are listening to you. People don't yet think about that as surveillance, but they do think about it as listening. How then we think about notions of privacy, of security, of trust, and of risk are all intensely complicated. We were tracking information about people's perceptions of privacy. Uh, there's a watershed event about three years ago, which is, of course, uh, Snowden. And interestingly, that it changes individual consumer and household activities about what information is being shared. It took a little while for it to happen, but we actually saw an uptake in all kinds of technologies, everything from Tor, which you have to be kind of committed to, to using, to people being much more attentive to the security protocols of their chat tools, so people trading Signal for WhatsApp and vice versa, and people starting to think about what were the other ways of thinking these things through. It's also the case that what they started to do was think about who did you trust and who didn't you trust? And what did you trust them with? Uh, unsurprisingly, trust in government has gone down in this period, as has trust in most other social institutions. And this is not just about notions of 
who's listening, but why are people listening and to what end? And frankly, when we've talked to human beings about this, so neither as citizens nor as consumers, the thing that is always deeply concerning is what is the evaluation that's being placed on top of this information? It's not that I don't expect you're going to know things about me. I expect you will. What I'm more concerned about is what do you think of me on the basis of those things and are you changing how you treat me and are you basically judging me through these things? So, you know, the first time we explained to people that their smart electrical meters were making assessments and sharing it back with the grid, I had multiple households say to me, wait, so like my electrical device is like gossiping with a utility about me? And gossip's an interesting word that way, right? It has a moral judgment attended to it and a notion of assessment. So how we think about these things, on the one hand, we see them as efficiencies. On the other hand, they are perceived as being something altogether different, which raises, of course, the issue of trust. Who do you trust? Under what circumstances? What does trust look like? Is it selective? Is it brand driven? Is it about what information you know about me and how you've chosen to use it so far? If we look at what brands have moved on the trust spectrum and what hasn't, it's been interesting to look at this. So, you know, have you been willing to defend your customers against what particular set of players? How have people thought about co-locating brand and trust? So there was a lot of debate two years ago in the Valley about why it was that Apple was willing to stand up against the FBI to be asked, you know, to basically go to court about cracking their security software and their security systems, because their argument was if we do this, then it's open slather and we're not willing to have that happen. That actually means different technical solutions have been implemented. Data is stored locally rather than in the cloud. How you think about all of those things turns out to be critical. How we think about signaling that to human beings turns out to be really quite hard. How do you say this is trusted versus this not being trusted? And you know, I don't think anyone's gotten this one particularly right, but I know it continues to be an interesting question. There is also an argument here that says people are willing to trade off certain amounts of privacy for certain amounts of uh, efficiency and gains. It turns out that's not always true and it's not um, unilinear. So just because you've done it once doesn't mean you'll do it again. Just because you trusted that group of people in this moment doesn't mean you'll trust them later. And the one thing we do know about this is it's really hard to get it back. And part of the reason it's really hard to get it back has to do with this, <laughs> which is people's fear about where all this technology is going is all about the robots and all about artificial intelligence and all about what the consequences of that may be. Uh, I'm willing to bet most of you who work anywhere in the tech field get asked a great deal about when the robot apocalypse is happening. Um, it never happens soon enough for me because I always have to go give another talk. Um, and the reality is that, you know, if we look at the robot apocalypse and the notion of the robots taking over, it's a complicated set of fears. Now, the reality is the most readily deployed robotic objects in the world, there's 10 million of them, are Roombas. So, robotic vacuum cleaner. So if you can climb stairs, you're probably safe, at least in the short term, from the robot apocalypse. <laughs> of course, the challenge about the Roomba is, while there are 10 million of them, what we didn't know about them was that in addition to sucking up our dirt, they were sucking up the footprints of our home, and now they are willing to sell that data. So suddenly, the robotic objects, it's less about, is your life in peril? It's more about, what do they know about you, and who are they going to tell? So what we've already seen is an enormous amount of activity around robotic objects, around notions of job replacement. Certainly the Oxford report that came out now two years ago that has the much touted figure of 40% job loss. If you drill down two clicks, that's not actually what it says. What it says is that there will be 40% task replacement and that some of those tasks ladder up to hold jobs. The reality is looking at those tasks and looking at those jobs is a very interesting exercise in terms of what sorts of activities can be automated and why and what sort of tasks can't be. We've been tracking this kind of stuff for a long time and one of the things that's really interesting to me is what categories of work feel more replaceable this time around than last time. So one of the interesting things if you spend any time looking at these kind of objects is that not physical robots, but certainly AI-like objects. The easiest tasks to automate in that sense are stationary, rule-based, and data-heavy. That turns out to sound remarkably like many of our jobs. Those are white-collar tasks. Those turn out to be mm, paralegals, certain kinds of diagnostics in, in medicine, certain kinds of other tasks where the rules are clear. Things that involve more ambiguity are much harder, and things that involve great deal of physical dexterity are really quite difficult indeed. Um, Carnegie Mellon University has a wonderful robot that folds laundry. I know, good, right? Fold laundry. Takes about 13 hours to fold a basket of laundry. <laughs> and it can't match socks. And it costs about a million dollars. 
this point it's starting to sound like men I've dated. Um, and, it's, and it's mostly useless. Now, the thing about that is over time, it, the price will come down and the efficacy will go up, but not inside an envelope where you could imagine deploying that in any standard kind of way. Because it turns out there are certain kind of tasks that humans are still better suited to and will be better suited to over a surprising period of time. So how we think through and do a better job of having this conversation is interesting. I think this is a place where knowing our history is good too. Why is it that stories about robots fear so, feel so fearful? Is because they're tied up with our history. And that's a literary and cultural history, not a technical history. But being clear about what's going on here is also really useful. And thinking about where efficiencies can be gained and where they can't is also really helpful. And how we think about that discourse of what is it that we are automating and why turns out to be useful. Which just leaves me on this last note here, which is that one of the things I'm always really struck by in conversations about the future is how the sole metrics we have for thinking about the future are about efficiencies and productivities. And we talk about how things will make us more efficient and more productive. And the reality is most really great technologies of the last thousand years also had another set of consequences. They made us better storytellers. They let us create magic and wonder and things remarkable. This photo comes from an experiment Intel did nearly two years ago now with the Royal Shakespeare Company where we instrumented Ariel inside the Tempest and did real-time um, augmented reality. There was enough uh, computation in this room to keep the space shuttle in, in space. It was really quite something. Um, but what it did was make possible an experience that was utterly transformative for everyone who was there. Did it make anyone more efficient? No. High productivity? Absolutely not. Did it give people a moment of splendor and wonder and magic? Yeah. And I sometimes think there's an interesting conversation to have about, as we think about the future of technology, what are the other things we might be looking at that aren't about productivities and efficiencies? For government, maybe that's about well-being. Maybe that's about engagement. Maybe that's about people feeling better connected as citizens. Maybe it's about feeling more empowered as citizens. Maybe it's about feeling more celebrated as citizens. I can think of lots of language there that isn't about more efficient engagement with government. So that might be nice too. Um, but there's something here about how do we think about magic that isn't as scary as that might sound. But that thinking about the future of technology where we weren't just thinking about efficiencies is really important. And so that leaves Gavin and I to have a bit of talk about how you put it all back together again. So I'm going to stop. There we go. I'm going over here. Yeah, you're on Got your strap saw. Got my strap saw. Well, thanks, Genevieve. That was uh, great and really, um, gee, I love the storytelling. So thank you. Thank you for not bombarding us with a host of Fact. facts and figures and everything else. So that, that sort of really captured the imagination of that. Million, 10 million robots is a fact. That is a fact. It is a fact. That is but, a fact, uh, true. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we have an opportunity for questions both here in the room and on the webcast. Uh, but just to get people thinking, um, I thought I might start with one and then we will we'll hand over. Um, so government has this thing around that wants to digitally transform government for the betterment of individuals and businesses. My question for you, and perhaps reflecting on why you joined Intel and what you experienced, is it's a question around culture. Um, how much of this leading the witness is a, an issue around culture rather than call it ability or technology itself? Listen, I think in order to have organisations that are able to reimagine themselves, there's a couple of features I think you need to have. So I think it's about how do you have trust in your leadership? How do you have a culture that celebrates risk, so that celebrates people actually trying things and seeing what happens? I think it's about how do you tell stories about um, moments of transformation. So how do you celebrate your cultural heroes not being the people that had the traditional careers but did interesting things? And then I think it's about how do you create processes that make it easier to do things differently. So one of the first things we did at Intel when I moved back into the R&D labs and was working for a new boss, and one of the things he was concerned about was that the labs had started to feel a bit stale. And he was really concerned that people didn't want to take risks anymore because they were really concerned about oh, shepherding their careers effectively, and they didn't want to try new things. He implemented this prize called the First Penguin Prize. Those of you who don't know penguins, the thing about penguins is they all sit on the ice floe for a really long time, and then one penguin jumps off, and then the rest follow. Now, the thing about that first penguin is sometimes they're first to food, and sometimes they're first into the whale. So it's a high-risk proposition, right? Being the first penguin, you know, willingness to get off the ice floe, uncertain future. And so my boss at the time said, we should have it, we should celebrate 
first off the ice floe. And we said to him, do you care if they succeed or fail? He said, that's not the point. The point is jumping off the ice floe. And so for the first two quarters we had that, no one wanted to get this award. Yeah. This was like a bad award, because this looked like, you're an idiot. You are reckless. You have jumped off the ice floe. And all of us are standing here going, you're an idiot. <laughs> And then after a while it became, because part of what we made him do wasn't just give people the awards, but tell yeah. the story of why. Yeah. And so part of it was how do you create alternate myths? How do you create alternate stories about what a career looks like, about what success looks like? How do you take some of the sting out of risk by knowing that even if you don't succeed, you're going to be lionized for trying? So for me as a, as a cultural anthropologist, one of the things I know is when you are making culture, it's not just about the processes and the rules, yeah. it's also about what are the stories you tell and what are the, the symbols that you yeah. make meaningful. I couldn't help but think that it would require a different approach to Senate estimates. They might all be first penguins. Yep. Mm. Right. Okay, questions, uh, questions in the room. Anyone got a question first? <coughs> Otherwise, I'll go to anything coming through webcast. I frightened you all into silence with my Sudafed Strepsil rant. Okay. All right. We got one over there in the front. Great. It'd be great if you just mentioned who you are and. <laughs> um, yes, you first penguin. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? I'm jumping. Um, David Pitsodic from the Department of Jobs and Small Business. Hi. Um, fan, um, like we all are, I'm sure. Um, so sad. I'm sorry and, you're not um, getting me at my best then, David. Uh, I just wanted to uh, talk a bit about um, what your thoughts were about the current trend around design thinking mm -hmm. and how from your vantage point over the last couple of de decades, what does that mean for organisations now? Um, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it diluting something? Is it augmenting something? So sort of design thinking discuss? Mm. Mm. Does everyone in the room know what he means by design thinking? OK, good. We were just going to assent to that. OK, good. Um, listen, I think design thinking is part of a, a long and honourable tradition. I would think back to participatory design, as in some ways its ancestor. So. Uh, European notion of how do you bring all the stakeholders together and imagine a future collaboratively. I think in that sense, design thinking has been an incredibly useful exercise of retooling people again back to saying, how do we think collectively and collaboratively about an outcome? How do we get better at imagining that outcome is going to have multiple points of view on it? I think insofar as that it has frequently created spaces for people to be a little less rigid about the ways in which they make knowledge and engage with each other, I think that's always a good thing. Um, I think it is a tool, no more, no less. I know some people think it is a, a, a sort of a, an epistemology. I don't. I think, you know, design thinking is part of a, a toolkit of a healthy organisation. I don't think it works for everything, any more than participatory design worked for everything. Um, I do think it's something that the notion of how do you create the spaces for that to happen is harder than just having a nice workshop. I think, you know, how it is that you make room for people who don't imagine they're your stakeholders and people who don't feel empowered to be in the conversation, even then to be there, is actually really hard work. And I think those are incredibly useful exercises for getting all of us more sensitive about what the broader context is in which we work. I think one of the other challenges sometimes to design thinking is that it becomes a checkbox exercise. So, did you have a design thinking workshop? Good, yay, go you, and now we will move on. As opposed to saying, what did that surface and how do we think of that as being part of an iterative process? Because I think for me the most useful thing about design thinking is its iterative nature and the notion that an answer isn't fixed, it needs to be constantly kind of renegotiated and updated. So, I think it's been a useful thing. I've watched it sort of evolve in the valley. I mean, there were certainly other things we did before it came along that looked like it, and it is definitely having a kind of a moment but there are pieces of it that I think ought to be in any healthy organisation and that require, in some ways, the most interesting thing about it, a decentering of power and authority, which is often really tricky. So, you know, one of the challenges frequently is you have a design thinking workshop and then you just go back to business as usual in the org chart. And that's a harder thing to manage. I don't think you should do design thinking for the Senate estimates, though it would be interesting. Would be very interesting. Mm, yeah. <laughs> All right, we've got a web question. Is that right? Okay, so I'll read it out. What ways might we protect our work on digital services so that we are not building in poor outcomes for whole communi uh, communities, not just, not the just majority. majority? From Pila. From Pila. 
Pillar, that's always a really good question, right? I think one of the answers there is how you think about balancing who, so I mean, the kind of notion of whole communities, not a majority, is actually a really hard thing. One of the challenges there is depending on what tools you are using, the majority is frequently what ends up predominating. So if you are using classic machine learning or deep learning and you're using the data to drive the outcome, the bulk of the data will get you to the outcome. So one of the challenges becomes what happens to the long tail there, right? What happens to the things that don't look normal or normative? They either get removed out of the data set, oh, that's just an outlier, and you don't deal with it. And I think one of the challenges there is how do we think about both what is our sampling methodology, how do we think about how you talk about the whole community, how do we think about how do you measure good outcomes? All of it becomes the kind of, um, in some ways, I think the hygiene you would have used for building government services historically, though frankly, I think we could have asked those questions critically of those too. So I don't think, you know, the digital piece for me makes it both easier and harder. It is easier to find the outliers in some ways because you have a clearer sense of what the data sets look like. I think it is harder because sometimes it causes us to want to move more quickly. And the reality here is good government actually takes time and engagement. It's not just can you build the thing and ship it tomorrow. And frankly, I mean, for me, one of the things that I think is complicated here, particularly as we move into a, a world of more sort of algorithms and artificial intelligence things, is that the, the way of doing innovation in the valley, really for the last, well, I want to say 25 years, but really in, the rea in reality, it's about 50 years, is you build it in beta. So you build a first pass of it. You throw it out. People iterate on it. And they do a lot of your testing work for you, i.e. all of us, who helpfully you know, tested you know, Google's search engine and built Amazon's recommendation engine through our actions, right? Every time we added a search, we built their database. Every time we, you know, we, it didn't quite work for us, we were helping them do their testing. That notion of build it in beta and iterate works really well if it's a recommendation engine for movies. I'd be much more concerned if it was something that was determining the level of your Medicare repayment system or the service delivery to your community. So there's something there about how we and I think it's true for algorithmic stuff in general, how do we rethink the notions of algorithms that have particular consequences for humans that are material consequences? How do we think about different, mo different models and methodologies for innovation that don't involve letting human beings wear the consequences of that yeah. when those consequences can be really quite devastating? Yeah. So there's an interesting thing about how do you test and iterate without letting it into the wild. And I think there for me, I'm thinking very much about Australia's history with things being feral well, it doesn't go well, we know, if you domestic, you know, you send them out there for a bit and see what happens. Think bunnies, can, you know, bunnies, camels, frogs, not yeah, good. Not good. Olive trees. <laughs> it's interesting just that uh, one around the potential impact on people. I think in the political context, it's probably even harder in a sense because one disenfranchised taxpayer or community member just dials up the political rhetoric around. Yeah, but on the that. other hand, on the other hand, I, so yes, yeah. but... I think we have been guilty of being lazy about certain kinds of technology development, right, where we took shortcuts. We did the easy thing. We bolted some more code onto the product rather than going back to ground zero. We weren't willing to have the hard conversations about why this piece of code was being privileged over that piece of code. And the reality is perhaps the move from talking to consumers to talking to citizens is a move where we actually have to get our stuff together, where you actually have to say, no, in fact, it requires a higher bar we ought to be more disciplined and we ought to be asking the hard questions about what are we building and why and what does something being good look like where good enough isn't actually appropriate. Yeah. I, don't think that's, I don't think that's unreasonable. Great. Question from the audience again. Over there on the left. Gentleman with your hand up. Hey, uh, Nick Ellis from Department of Industry. I'm just asking uh, sort of what your thoughts are on how we get to a bit more of a democratic and human-friendly internet, especially with the Mueller stuff just recently and, and uh, astroturfing and um, being able to spoof a, a grassroots organisation and also uh, sort of how do, how do you get around the fact that there's culture inbuilt into some of the platforms? So there's a fairly libertarian culture built into a lot of the big tech companies and therefore people get to say whatever they want without there being... Community? Yeah. Oh. Gosh, that's a good question. And it was really striking. I've 
was in the US until last Friday. And I was there over that last fortnight, and it was an interesting time to be there for all kinds of reasons. So listen, I think those are all hard questions to which I don't think there are easy answers. I do need to parenthetically make an advertisement here for my current employer, which would be the Australian National University. Um, and the Crawford Forum is coming up in June, and Vince Cerf is here, and he and I are doing a conversation on exactly that topic, so please come. I know he'll be appropriately dogmatic about this in ways that will be useful and instructive, and I can't kind of do him justice. Listen, I think there's a couple of pieces there that are really important. In the last, I would say, sort of two to three years, a number of companies have scaled to a point that I don't think even they imagined they would. And in that scaling, have had to come to terms with the fact that certain of the things they thought were technologies are actually ideologies. And in the process of doing that, I think it's put an enormous amount of tension on a couple of systems. One of them is state-based regulation. So I think we are in an interesting moment intellectually where there was for the last at least 80 years a kind of very um, intertwined relationship between capitalism and citizens, capitalism and democracy. They kind of went hand in hand. I think in some ways those are fragmenting now and it's creating interesting moments to think about who is going to regulate some of those transnational platforms. How do we think about what the regulations might look like? Are there bright spots that you'd look to? I mean, I certainly think where the EU is going in terms of talking about notions of individual ownership of data, regulations of the platform of speech acts on those platforms suggest that it is possible to regulate them. What Twitter looks like in Germany is very different than what it looks like in the US. So it is possible to imagine that just because these are platforms of scale doesn't mean that the scale means they are universally the same everywhere. I think for a number of the people running those companies, they are certainly at a moment of critical reflection uh, slash existential crisis um, about what it means to be at that scale. And I think the conversations inside those places, at least, I'm not sure that it's comforting exactly, but they're at least having those conversations now, which were certainly not there two years ago. Um, how you unpack all that stuff, listen, I think it's... I think one of the hard things here is that human societies take a really long time to adapt to new technologies. And most of us in the room were early adopters, I'm willing to bet, and we forget that most of the rest of the world wasn't an early adopter. Um, I sometimes use the example of television as a parallel. I mean, you know, when I was a child, television was already 20 years old in Australia, and my family was still arguing about how far away you sat from it, how much you watched, whether you turned it off when guests came over. The answer was always, except when the cricket was on. Um, you know, should you turn it off when the program you were watching? I mean, like, there's a whole kind of thing. Like, was American television bad for us? I mean, clearly, yes. It was that whole kind of thing, right? <laughs> And I, you know, flash forward, I'm like, yeah, that's 40 years since my childhood. We're still having those conversations about television, even though it's now on a laptop screen or a mobile phone, right? We're still asking how much is bad? Should we watch less? Do we turn it off when people are over? Oh my God, is there too much American television? Like the questions haven't changed. And it's taken us a long time to work out how to fit that as a technological and a social object into our lives. And I think the reality here is the same will be true about the internet and about the web and frankly about the things that sit on top of that. The challenge is, of course, scale and speed. But the thing to also remember there, right, is that much like all those other technologies, the internet actually is not a universal thing. What it feels like in Australia is very different than what it feels like in America. Not just because here it's really slow. Um, <laughs> it actually feels different in terms of how it is regulated, how it is delivered, how it is costed, what services are available and what ones aren't. And I think one of the things we're not always good at bringing into that conversation is the notion that the internet is in and of itself, when it was first created, it was both a manifestation of a particular kind of cultural ideology and of a particular set of players that was both built into the way it was built technically and the way it was built socially. And as it has scaled globally, it's stripped those two things apart. So that the notions that it was gonna be either what the boys of the well thought <laughs> versus what DARPA thought. That was already an inherent tension. But some of the choices that were made even about the architecture of the internet don't scale. You know, the way the internet is configured with, you know, or basically centers and nodes isn't working particularly well for the internet of things, has enormous challenges for how we think about um, any autonomous technologies hanging off the edge of it. We know we're gonna have to re-architect pieces of it technically as well as economically, which I suspect will also in turn mean how we re-architect it in the other ways. And I know that sounds like a really long answer, and it is. The only other piece I would throw onto that kind of pyre 
would be to say, I think it is interesting that we are now in 2018 and we are also relitigating our relationships with every other infrastructure I can think of. So we are having conversations again about electricity. We're having conversations about water and roads and the internet and telephony. And there's something interesting to imagine that a number of those things, I think when I was a kid, I didn't think we would be talking about electricity in 2018. I think I thought I imagined that was done. Um, and the same with some of those other things. And it's interesting to imagine what it says about this moment in time in particular, about why it is that infrastructure is differently up for grabs again. Great. We might, uh, how are we going for time? We've got time for one on the web. What do you think the future, think? is the I'd future of cryptocurrencies? cryptocurrencies? Oh, I think there's someone in the room who can answer that question much better than I am. Um, somewhere in the room there is lurking a man who is actually the expert in cryptocurrencies. Did you see him? Uh, I know Rob Hansen is somewhere around. I could dob on someone else. Rob, where are you? you? Anyway, what do I think about the future of cryptocurrencies? Listen, digital money is an interesting proposition. Cryptocurrencies likewise. I think had you asked me about the future of blockchain rather than Bitcoin and Ethereum and Ripple, I would give you a different answer, which is that I think blockchain is a more interesting proposition than cryptocurrencies. However, the fact that one of the things we have seen successively over the last 20 years is a remapping of what the impact of the internet and digital technologies are on successive institutions. Financial institutions are clearly being disrupted the same way, you know, hotels were disrupted and travel was disrupted and music and entertainment, they are kind of in line here. Cryptocurrencies is one way of thinking about that. Can we create financial systems that are absent banking infrastructures, absent, you know, certain kinds of regulations and that span the globe? Well, we, I mean, clearly we already have. I mean, whether you want to think about it that way or not, the, the existence of the dark web, Silk Road, and other kinds of ways that money gets moved. Money has always moved outside the market. It didn't need to be digital for that to happen. We you know, converted it in all kinds of complicated ways into goods and possessions and sewed them into the hems of our skirts when we fled to different countries. We've you know, worked out how to move money around absent the formal market for a long time. I think the future of cryptocurrencies may be less about the next platform and more about what does it actually say about the current institutions that we are fascinated by this. So what is it about the nature of the financial institutions that leads us to keep thinking cryptocurrencies is the answer? Is it that we want platforms that are easier to move money around the globe? Is that because we're up to nefarious purposes or because we don't trust banks or because we think it's really hard as a human being to move money from our families here to our families somewhere else? Is it that we want to have the free flow of goods and services outside of state-based regulation? For me, the question is less about what is the future of cryptocurrencies as what is the future of goods and services and mechanisms of payment. Yeah. And then I think, you know, thinking about are those things back-ended digitally, that's certainly one way of thinking about it. But for me, I would still go back to saying I think blockchain is more interesting than Bitcoin. Yeah, and as someone who spent 30 years in the financial services industry, perhaps a conservative mindset when it comes to money, I would question if you're into Bitcoin, you know, the underlying value, <laughs> what underpins the underlying value of the currency. Yeah, but the better question there is less about, you know, is Bitcoin a racket than yeah. it is about what is it about that that's seductive, yeah. right? I mean, if you think about the original configuration of the internet and the web, it was built in with protocols for microcurrency transactions, and we have never found a way to successfully do that. Yeah. And managing to think about how do you do microcurrency transactions a part and parcel of a promise about what a more successful internet of things would look like. Now, I'm not sure cryptocurrencies gets you there, but if you think about how do we do better, I mean, all the kind of promises, right? How do you do better parking infrastructures where your car could pay for the parking rather than the endless parking meter from hell that involves <laughs> apps and phones and coins, but sometimes none of those things, where your car knows who you are anyway. It should just as easily be your, your wallet. There are lots of ways of saying cryptocurrencies may not be it, but thinking about how do we, in, you know, how do you make microtransaction payments part and parcel yeah. of the Internet of Things is a really different question, yeah. but I think a reasonable one. Yeah. Great. Question from the audience? Got one up there, hand up. Oh, we got to, actually, I'm, could I go next to Nick? Is that all right? Yeah, no questions for you, Oscar. All right, Oscar, I'll come back to you. I'm Kate Rose, I'm a new grad at Industry Innovation and Science. Okay. And you talked a lot about appliances and gadgets gathering data from us and then being used by government and companies 
to deliver better services and products that are tailored to our needs. But do you think that disadvantaged people or people in very remote communities who don't have Fitbits and Roombas might be left behind because the data is not being used and tailored to their needs? I would say that is a, an interesting problem, right? So I think one of the challenges around most visions of the Internet of Things is that it relies on an infrastructure that isn't globally distributed. And that, in fact, one of the challenges for many economically or geographically disenfranchised communities is that they are not part and parcel of those stories and not being sampled. Now, that's a twofold challenge, right? One of them is that means that you don't always have access to those services. It also means that your lived experiences are not being modelled in the future of those services. Now, the flip side of that is that we also know that in many economically and geographically and socially disenfranchised communities, you have other forms of data gathering that are happening with different degrees of consent and buy-in. So, you know, what does it mean to think about having uh, cash cards in Indigenous communities? What does it think, uh, you know, what does it mean to think about the presence or non-presence of everything from electricity to telephony? And so, the reality is, Let's be clear, I'm, you know, I am deeply skeptical about most of the visions about the Internet of Things. I find myself profoundly troubled by many of the quantified self technologies. I think many of the ways they are used are deeply troubling, and I'm not convinced that is a good future. I think there's an interesting argument about what it means to be not connected in the 21st century, and the challenges of that when the mechanism by which you are expected to engage with government is indeed through connectivity. So. I spent some time with the South Australian government 10 years ago when I was their thinker in residence, and part of my challenge was to sample the state and look at what the barriers to adoption were for the internet and how to think about that. And one of the things I did then was I speed tested the internet all over South Australia um, because I was really interested to know about uh, connectivity. And one of the things I found was that the further away you got from Adelaide, the harder it was to have enough bandwidth to fill in a government form. Now, one of the challenges was that the government was moving increasingly to online engagements with its citizens, and you couldn't actually connect to the government when the internet was sufficiently poor that you couldn't get connected. Now, that creates an interesting double disenfranchisement, right, is that you are not only not connected, but you are beyond the imagination of connectivity, and you are beyond being able to be part of the conversation about being connected, because most of the way you sampled citizens was through complaining on websites that you couldn't get access to, which was kind of delightfully complicated. However, one of the other things that became really clear in that process, and this is not, um, was this an economic disenfranchisement thing in multiple ways, is that one of the things that governments have not been prepared to do in many jurisdictions is, I don't want to say impose, but is to suggest an appropriate um, data rate. So one of the things about the way the internet is configured in Australia is that it is usually a five to one to seven to one download versus upload speed. So the internet is configured for you to download rather than upload. Um, now, there are reasons for that that have to do with the history of how the technology developed, but it doesn't need to be that way. And in fact, it, frankly, in many countries that have better broadband than we do, it isn't that way. One of the interesting consequences if you have an internet that is geared for download, not upload, is that you cut off certain kinds of participation of all of your citizens, not just some of them. And that by having the internet basically be a download medium rather than an upload medium, you make it quite hard to think about how people communicate, how they connect to others, how they build community, how they engage in creativity, how they collaborate. And there are some interesting consequences for that, and frankly being borne out in the United States by the end of net neutrality. So one of the things that that suggested economically was that in fact you were going to create a world in which certain people had their data move more quickly than others. And so even if you imagined a world where everyone is connected, you start to imagine a world where some people are better connected than others. And I think all of those things are deeply troubling. So for me, the shorter answer would have been, there are things we could do to do a better job of connecting all Australians that look remarkably like things we have done for 100 years about access to electricity, radio, television, the internet. But I also think there are things we ought to be doing proactively looking forward about ensuring that that connectivity is an appropriate baseline, where the baseline isn't simply you are connected, but you are connected in a way that means you can have meaningful engagements. And that's not about a download-oriented internet. That's actually about an upload-oriented internet, which would look very different than what we have now. 
and then thinking about where we would as a country want to be vis-a-vis -vis something like net neutrality is a conversation we ought to be having because it's one that has profound consequences, particularly if you think about moving to a world where you're going to add more things onto the network that consume data. So whether that's autonomous vehicles, whether that's Internet of Thing things, they tend to have certain kinds of data needs that we aren't anticipating in how we think about the structuring of things. Thanks, Genevieve. Well, I've, I've received a subtle um, directive around. It said, wrap it up on the uh, digital board over there. Stop now. Stop now. Stop now. So um, Tom, stop now. Tom has flown. Um, it's just been incredible, actually, amazing. I think you've, uh, we've had such a rich conversation, uh, certainly from my part. Um, again, I think you just generate a curiosity in one's own thinking. So thank you for that and, and sharing your insights. Um, I won't try to wrap it up and do a, a summary because uh, uh, I wouldn't do it justice. I'd probably, you presented seven great questions to us. And so I'd sort of encourage everyone you know, in the audience and also those that are streaming is, you know, what are your questions and what conversation uh, are you going to have uh, back in, in your own organisations as we think about this wonderful thing called digital and transformation, but particularly uh, with a focus on how do we improve outcomes for uh, citizens and, and customers of government and, and how that manifests itself in, in your thinking. Uh, Genevieve, again, thanks. You've been extraordinarily generous. Uh, I know you weren't feeling well, but we wouldn't have picked it uh, at all. And uh, I'm sure we'll have you back, but let's give Genevieve a, a warm round.